Hey guys, it's Casey, and welcome back for another Unreal tutorial. So today, we're going to do a little bit of a weird video, and I hope that this can be helpful for some people, but I'm going to talk about kind of how does Unreal work, or what is, I think Unreal calls it, what is the gameplay framework of Unreal. So we're going to go kind of step by step and go through, well, what is the background process of how Unreal really works. So I'm going to pull up my very wonderful notepad here. We're actually going to hide half of this. We're going to talk about this first half of this text document first. So when you start the game, what really happens is that we load the engine, and that when we load the engine, the first thing we do is we load the game instance. And what the game instance is, it, it, it is kind of as it is called the instance, it is this instance of the game. So when you launch the game for this time, this game instance is going to be perpetual for this entire game, this entire gameplay session until you close the game. That's really important because almost nothing else is perpetual across the entire gameplay session. For example, our world, if we are to change levels, everything in, inside the world and below it gets completely cleared whenever we change levels. However, the game instance is perpetual across changing levels. So in theory, if we created a game instance, and let's say we put an integer inside of it, like the amount of XP that the player gained this gameplay session, just some random statistic, we could gather that up in like the first level that the player is playing. They get a thousand XP, and we're storing it inside that integer. We could have the player change levels, and we can still have that value available during the next level to keep adding on to. If we were to store that pretty much anywhere else, that would get wiped, that would get cleared out, and that when you change levels, you don't have access to them anymore. So the game instance is actually this really useful tool that if you need to transfer data across multiple levels, across transitioning levels, that is how you would do it. So within the game instance, the game instance will hold what the current world we are in. That's fairly obvious, but then the world itself is going to hold a game mode, and a game mode is the server-only rules of the game, and I'm, we're going to go deeper into this. I'm going to show you inside the editor how this stuff works. But the game mode itself kind of holds the rules of the game. It tells us what can be a spectator, is the game possible, things like that, and this is only on a server. And I put an asterisk here in the three of these, because the game mode, the game state, and the player state really don't matter very much if you are not doing a multiplayer game. If you're doing a single player game, you can almost ignore the three of these. There are times where you might be able to get some usefulness out of like a game state or something, but for the most part, these three really only take priority inside of a multiplayer game. But the game mode, it holds the rules of our game. This is server only, so if we need things that the client can never see or should never see or can ever manipulate potentially in like a malicious way, this is where we would hold things inside the game mode only on the server. The game state is kind of a subset of our game mode, and this is kind of the same thing as a game mode. It holds rules of our game and some stuff like that, but this is replicated to clients. So if we wanted something like team scores, like if we had a game like Counter-Strike, where we had terrorists and counter-terrorists, where we might store the score of the game or the score of both teams would be inside the game state. We want our players to know about it, and it's pertinent to how our game works. So that's where something we might store in something inside the game state. And then below that is our player state. And this is kind of the same as the game state, where it's replicated to all players, but there's an instance of this for all players. So this might be where we would store player scores, potentially, a kill-death ratio is potentially where we would store inside the player state because potentially we want everyone to know about the, the player's score so that they can see it, but it's not as pertinent as being team-wide, stuff like that. It's very specific to that player. So where do we access all of these things? So to create any of these, I guess we should do that first. If we right-click in, in, inside of our editor and we do a new blueprint class, we can search for things like our game instance. And if we wanted to, we could create a new game instance, and we can call this new game instance. And actually, if I open this up, you're going to see it has nothing special inside of it. It just looks like a normal blueprint, but you don't have any components or anything like that. If we wanted to, we could still create custom events. We can make variables. We can do whatever we want. But this really isn't anything special. But what we can do is if we go into our top left and we do edit and we do our project settings, we can then go to our maps and modes and we can change things like on the very bottom, we can change our game instance to potentially our new game gameplay instance. So that means that when our game gets started at the very start of it, it will create this instance. And I guess maybe we should take another jump and we'll pull up a graph real quick.
So this is from the Unreal Docs, and if we look at this right side, when we start the engine in a standalone version, meaning not inside of the editor, what happens is that it initializes the game engine, and then the first thing it does is it creates that game instance. That game instance that we created here, the first thing it does after it opens the engine is it creates this instance of our gameplay session. And then further down, we initialize it, it does some other things, and then we create some kind of like, if you're using Steam, it might do stuff here. But after it does the game instance, next really important thing that it does is it starts our first world. And then underneath our world, once our world gets created, it creates our game mode. And then after a game mode gets done, then it starts spawning the actors and actually begins the game. So you can see kind of the flow here, how it starts the engine, then it creates the game instance, then the world, then the game mode, and then our game states and player states and stuff like that. So. How we can affect that, like I showed, we can create any of these through that through the creating of the uh, the actor classes, and in here we can change our different instances. If we want to create a different game mode, that's where we would swap it here. So if we wanted to, we'll, we'll go through that. We do a blueprint class, and this one we don't even have to search; it's just right here. We can make a new gameplay mode, so we can call this new gameplay mode. If we wanted to, we could do our drop down, and now we have our new gameplay mode. And you can see inside of our new gameplay mode, actually, if we want to open it up. We can see that on the right side here, under our class defaults, it will say what is the default game session, what is the default game state, and our HUDs, and our spectators, stuff like that. For the most part, none of this is really too important. This is this really comes into play during a multiplayer game. For a single player game, you might use some of this, you might need to replace some of it with your own. But for the most part, like I said before, this often is for multiplayer, a lot of this. So that's how we can manipulate our gameplay mode. And if we wanted to, we could actually, if we set it here inside of our project settings, this will try and set for all maps. What is our gameplay mode? Or our game mode. I shouldn't say gameplay mode. It's our game mode. But if we wanted to, inside of our world, if we do our window and we have our world settings turned on, if we go into the, our world settings on the right here, we can actually override our game mode and set it to any game mode. So potentially each individual map could potentially be running its own game mode. And that's important to realize because as I said, if when we change levels, everything underneath the world and the world itself gets wiped. The only thing that persists is the game instance. So it's kind of important to realize that when we switch levels, our game mode gets wiped, our game state gets wiped, everything gets wiped. So it's just kind of like, that's why with different levels, we can have different game, different game modes. Reason being is because they get wiped anyways. Why not be able to switch them, if, if that makes sense? You can't switch game instances. Game instances, you can't do that. I don't believe you can do that at least. So that's kind of the background structure of how Unreal works. It's kind of boring, it's kind of bland. It's not really that interesting. If you're doing multiplayer, you definitely need to be familiar with this stuff, but if you're just making a normal single player game, the one big thing to realize here is that our game instance is perpetual across our levels. So that could be very useful for storing data. So if we take the next rabbit hole down, and let's extend this, what we start to get into is we start to get into kind of how does code work? And this is kind of more like C++, I guess, but it's also how blueprint works, or blueprints work, or at least the background of blueprints. And how Unreal works is that we use classes, and classes are object-oriented programming, kind of structured data and code. That's just kind of how games are made. I don't really know if it's possible to make a game that's um, that's not object-oriented pro programming, but it's just at least worth to know. That's how Unreal works, is that we create classes, and then with these classes, we define variables. We define all these different things inside of them, functions. And then we create instances of these classes that actually do things. And well, if we are more specific here, we create actors. So what we can do is we can right click, and we can make a new blueprint class, and we can make a new actor class. And I can call this our orange class, or our fruit class, or something like that. And then inside of this, we can add all this wonderful stuff. We could add some static meshes, and we can add some variables. We can do whatever. We can add some functions. But then what happens is that this is only a class. What we just created was a class. This class can't exist in the world itself. You can't just make a class exist. What you have to do is you have to make an object of a class exist. And that's kind of what I wrote here, is that we create a class, but then underneath a class is that we get an object instance. And an object instance is, I put actor here because it doesn't always have to be an actor, but it's a specific object or a specific actor that belongs to one of these classes. So if we wanted to spawn something in the world, like if we were to go inside of our level blueprint, and we were to try and do um, spawn actor, 
If we wanted to spawn an actor, what do we have to feed in? We have to feed in a class reference. What we just created there with our orange was, oops, what did I call that? Oh, I called it fruit, sorry. With that fruit class is that that's what we made there, that we made a class. And that once we spawn it, what it spits out is it spits out a class object reference, right? More, more specifically, it spits out an object reference. And this object reference is going to be that specific actor inside of the world. If you watch my, um, my Unreal Basics video, I really tried to harp on that in one of the one of the parts of that about objects being specific. This is a specific third person character. If we made a second one, this second one could potentially hold different values. Its health number could be different than this guy. This guy could be 100 health, this guy could be 80 health. They could have different stuff going on. It's very important to realize that the class is the overarching kind of definition of what they are. It defines what they can do or can't do. It defines what their variables are and what their functions are. But then within them, you create specific objects of those classes and those objects can go off and kind of do their own thing. They can hold different values, they can behave different ways in theory, and they can be doing things at different times. It's, it's important to realize that. So with that being said, the main ones that we really care about are actors, pawns, and characters. So if we right click again and we do a new blueprint class, you can see the first three that we see here, because they are really the most important, is that we get an actor. And by definition, an actor is an object that can be placed or spawned in the world, like our third person character, like our fruit class. Basically anything that can exist in our world is going to be some sort of actor. But then there's a subset of actor called pawn, and a pawn is, is an actor that can be possessed. So if we needed an actor that needed to be able to be controlled by the player or by AI, that's where a pawn comes in. Actors cannot be possessed by any type of controller. Pawns can. And below a pawn is a character, and a character is a type of pawn that has the ability to walk around, meaning it's basically a pawn that has a movement component built into it. But these are the three that you will use 99% of the time when you're making a game. So let's talk a little bit more about some of these. So with pawns, they can get controlled. Controllers come in two types, and I put this down here, and that they can be a player controller or an AI controller. And it's important to realize that Pawns can persist after, or controllers can persist after a pawn's death. Think about a multiplayer game like Battlefield. Um, like, I guess Battlefield 1 is one that I'm most familiar, familiar with. I haven't played the new one, but I think they all behave the same in that you're running around as your guy, you're shooting your gun, but then when you die, what happens? The camera usually zooms out and you go to the top of the world map, and that once you spawn back in, it zooms back in and you are your character. Your controller, your player controller, never got destroyed in that process. Your controller, which pot potentially holds some information about who you are, never died. It, it was persistent across that, and all it did is it destroyed your that pawn that you were controlling, or more specifically, that character that you were controlling. When you died, it probably destroyed it. You zoomed out, your controller is still existent, and that when it spawns the new pawn, your controller was inserted into that new pawn's kind of brain. So that's how that, that, that flow works there. And with AI controllers, AI controllers are a lot like player controllers, except that they don't receive inputs, and they, you potentially, what, we, what you make them do is you make them think for themselves, and how you do that instead of using inputs is you use behavior trees and blackboards, and those kind of get inserted into your AI controller. Not too important, but there are some important things here, and if we kind of look at how inputs work, I have another graph in here. So our, here's the gameplay framework, here's another graph from Unreal or... Um, flow chart from unreal you have your player controller it gets thrown into your game mode and your game state it possesses a pawn but then it also contains things like your hud your input your camera manager stuff like that not too interesting but here is the input flow chart and this can be very important when you start working with widgets or you start trying to put player inputs in several places you have to be careful with this and what happens is that when you press a key it goes to the game that says hey are one of these inputs mapped? And what that means is that if we go back into our project settings, we can go into our inputs, and it's basically checking when you press a key, does it belong to one of these? And that, that's kind of what that first part is doing there. And then when it comes in, for a start, let's ignore this input enable actor. Let, let's ignore that at, at, at first. But when it comes in, it's gonna go to our player controller and it's gonna execute any commands inside of our player controller linked to that input. Then it's gonna go to our level blueprint execute any input commands with, with that in our level blueprint, then down to our controlled pawn, do anything there, and then it's done. 
However, if we wanted to, we can make certain actors, we can put them at the start of this list. We can specifically do make them input enabled and throw them before everything. And why this is important is that inputs don't necessarily make it all the way to the bottom. If we ever consume the input, it will stop in its place and it won't go further down. So an example of this can be like a widget. If we wanted like our pause menu to, to stop anything below this, potentially if like we pressed escape inside of our pause menu, we don't want it to leave our pause menu and then come down to our player and inside of our player we also have escape that reopens the pause menu. You can see how that would be dumb if we allowed that escape input to keep going down and down because we're inside the pause menu, we're pressing escape to leave it, but then it goes to down and down and it gets our pawn and then it throws the escape command again and reopens it. So you can see how that just, it doesn't make sense. So in that situation, we would want to consume that escape input and not allow it to go further down the list. So important to realize consuming inputs stop them from traveling down this list. There is also inside of, if we open up our third person character, there's also an important thing to realize. We can, um, with our with any of our input events, you can see with them selected in the top right, we have consume input. So this means if we were to go inside of like our level blueprint, I think we might be able to, I can't remember, can we do, um, can we do that? Yes, we can. So if we called like our input event here, like our turn rate, if we did this inside of our level blueprint and we had this consume the input, that means that when it hit our level blueprint, it would not allow it to go down to the pawn. If we wanted it in both places and that we wanted access to that input in our level blueprint and our pawn, what we would need to do with it selected is disable consume input and that allows it to keep getting passed down this list. So another important thing to realize and in general, this is just how our games work. This is the basics of how the game, of how Unreal works, is that we're creating these things that control kind of the conditions of our game, but then the actual gameplay itself and the code itself is really dr being driven by actors, and specifically instances of actors inside of our world. And if we want to just do one more quick graph that, for the heck of it, this is a big old chart, thanks to Unreal, about the life cycle of an actor. So if we just want to go through this quick, if we spawn an actor, it initializes it, it does some weird things that we can't really control here, but then it executes its construction script. And then it does some things here, it initializes its components, stuff like that, but then you can see we hit begin play. So this is pretty cool because this kind of directly relates to if we like open up our third person character, we can type tick and we can type begin play. And you can see here that we have our construction script, so that's how that relates in that First, we did our construct construction script here, and then we hit our begin play, and after our begin play, we do our ticking. And then this is just basically it's saying, are any of these conditions met? Are we destroying the actor? Are we changing levels? Whatever it happens to be, it essentially destroys the actor over time and garbage collects it. That's not too important, but that's just the life cycle of an actor if you're interested in that. But all of this is kind of directly taken from the docs, and this is kind of how the docs are laid out. There's like maybe like 20 pages of the docs that they're essentially trying to explain these things. For me, these these kind of, what I just went over was never really useful for me when I was learning just because this wasn't how I really thought about things. But I know some people like to think about things this way and they want to have these things clearly laid out and kind of in order of how they execute and how they work. But that's essentially the framework of how games work in Unreal. If that was helpful for you, awesome. If not, I could understand. It's kind of some offhand information that's really not too important. But I figured it was worth making, so I'll see you guys in the next video.